Well, good evening, and uh, now that we've overcome our little technical difficulties, uh, thank you for attending tonight's uh, final uh, lecture in the spring series for the Indigenous Research Institute. Uh, my name is Dr. Alden Yellowhorn, and before we get started, I would like to welcome you all to the homeland of the Musqueam, tsleil Squamish, and Stolo First Nations. Uh, tonight we have our guests from uh, Shikwapmuk, who are here to uh, give us our final lecture. Uh, Dr. Marianne Ignace, who is a faculty member in uh, the Department of Linguistics and also in First Nations Studies. And uh, Dr. Ron, <coughs> Ron Ignace, chief of the Skeetchison Band and alumnus of uh, SFU. Uh, so this evening's talk will be uh, Shikwetmik Oral History and Indigenous Law. Uh, we will have an opportunity at the end uh, to ask some questions. And I would ask you, uh, if you, when you're uh, asking questions, maybe we'll give you a microphone, uh, speak into the microphone because we're recording the sessions and we'd like to hear the questions as well as the answers. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our guest lecturers tonight. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, uh, this is, we haven't had the opportunity to rehearse, so it, it's going to be touch and go sometimes as we go along. But this is part of a, a three-series uh, lecture. I guess you, you can say that we've sort of combined into one and shortened yes and shortened <laughs> so uh, we we uh, I've uh, gotten interest in uh, we've been in interested in looking at Suhwepam Kalaw basically because uh, what uh, my my objective is that I would like to see one day uh, indigenous law uh, stand equally beside common law and the civil code in Canada. But uh, I get carried away, okay. Okay, so uh, the presentation here is uh, part of a, I guess a project that uh, has been going on for 30 years or so. Um, part of the work was uh, Ron's PhD dissertation, our uh, oral histories are our iron posts that uh, he completed in 2008. And my research with the uh, Sohuatmuk people around a whole variety of topics that covers oral histories, uh, discourse, uh, place names, uh, and sense of place, um, traditional resource tenure, ethnobotany goes back about 30 years now. And uh, so we've, in the last uh, several years, uh, kind of combined the research that Ron previously did and uh, what, what I'd done uh, and produced a forthcoming manuscript, uh, People, Lands, and Laws, of which this is a little bit of an uh, excerpt. And um, around the topic of um, uncovering um, Sukhwapmuk indigenous laws, not from a perspective as lawyers, neither of neither us are lawyers, we're uh, anthropologists, linguists, First Nations community members, politicians uh, from those kind of walks of life. So uh, we uh, basically have taken this on the, on the road in the Sukhwapmuk Nation in the last few years as uh, organized by our Shushbab Nation Tribal Council. Uh, and uh, actually also taught it uh, as a special topics course in First Nation Studies a couple of years ago that we also took on the road through various Sukhwapmuk communities. Uh, for those of you who um, are not familiar with the uh, indigenous cultural and political or linguistic landscape throughout BC, uh, the Sukhwapmuk uh, is one of the larger and northernmost interior Salish nations in the in south central interior of British Columbia. 
We live in a territory that comprises about 160,000 square miles, roughly from Jasper in the northeast down to Ashcroft in the southwest, and then across to uh, near the head of Okanagan Lake, and actually then over into the Kootenays, where we have an outlier community in, on the upper Columbia. And Sukhwapmukho uh, Loch, which is Sukhwapmukh country or territory, is a biodiverse and ecologically diverse area, although many of you associated with the bunch grass, sagebrush, dry interior, but we actually have uh, nine diverse biogeoclimatic zones that range from alpine uh, areas to uh, subalpine and rich uh, upper elevation meadows and coniferous forests, uh, right down to those dry valley bottoms. And um, we have about 8,000 Sohuatmuk, of whom uh, about half live in one of, and I, I wrote here 16 and a half reserve communities, which sounds perhaps a little bit funny, but uh, we, we had, until a smallpox epidemic in the early 1860s wiped out more than two thirds of the population, we had more than 30 indigenous communities throughout Sohuatmuk and uh, 17 of them remained, then became uh, bands under the Canadian Indian Act. And uh, one of them, through a fluke of de uh, demography, I guess you could say, has become more Lilouet or Stratliamch than Suhwatmuk in, in the past century. Uh, so hence 16 and a half. And uh, the word Suhwatmuk means the people of the spread out land. Suhwat means to break open. And before we carry on, we would like to thank and honor the many elders uh, from all of our communities who have uh, supported our work through the past decades. Um, and I think it's important to also point out that of the uh, elders you see in this photo, uh, only two are still with us. So we have lost many people in the, whoops, in the, past decades, uh, but we were fortunate to the, that they shared their knowledge of the land and Sukhwapmukh culture and society with us. So, um, our research on Sukhwapmukh oral history, its connection to Sukhwapmukh indigenous law is part of a larger ethnographic and ethnolinguistic project and research. And uh, we will address why is it important to understand and articulate indigenous law in general, and Sukhwapmukh law in particular. Uh, one central concept that we will talk about is the, what significantly in Salish languages, what we have as a noun in English is a whole phrase, and uh, a whole, uh, in Sukhwapmukh Chin, a lot more stuff and more interesting stuff takes place in verbs. So we have the phrase is This is, could mean it's our law. It could mean it's our deeds of the ancestors. It could mean it's our rights and writing. And it could even mean paper. So it covers a whole spectrum of things that uh, also are historically connected. And we will then in particular talk about three aspects of Sukhwapmukh law, the law of land and resource use between nations and within the Sukhwapmukh nation as they emerged throughout the process of history, issues like trespass, access, and the nature of land tenure. We will then talk about environmental and resource law and laws of social conduct. So <clears throat> The, you know, the, the fact that we as Sukhwapam, we had a, and have our own laws, uh, and this, uh, it's a way to, uh, it was a way that uh, we maintain peace, order, and good government uh, within our nation, and uh, it's also uh, underscores our ownership and jurisdiction of our Sukhwapam Hulu, which uh, the doctrine of discovery uh, has not, uh, paid attention to or disregards that we, we did have our own laws and we did govern ourselves and that we were uh, an organized society. And as we're uh, rebuilding our nations today, 
on the ashes of uh, Canadian colonialism, which we are uh, hammering with our sledgehammers to tear down. And, uh, and we, we're looking at turning our own, to our own ways of doing things, our own traditions and our own laws to rebuild our, our nation. And it's for these reasons that uh, uh, we've looked into the legal scholarships and has, we've begun to articulate principles and examples of indigenous law uh, by, as, as laid out by Jay Burroughs, drawing out law and Val, Val Napoleon. And others. And others, yeah. Um, I'd like to also start with a quote by Val Napoleon, who some of you probably know. She uh, teaches law at the University of Victoria and uh, wrote her dissertation on uh, Gitsan indigenous law some years ago. And uh, she's reminded us that there are many ways to think about law. Basically, how we think about law is shaped by our experiences and history. As indigenous peoples, we have gained much of our current understanding of law from our experiences with the Western legal system in Canada. We know the Western legal system through its courts, legislation, and enforcement, and by its treatment of our people's lands and resources. Given this, many indigenous peoples have come to associate law with power, punishment, hierarchy, and bureaucracy. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that uh, from the point of view of the institutions of uh, Canadian society that we deal with, uh, th this concept is laden with burden and with experiences in particular of indigenous peoples in Canada. And it's all, all the Canadian laws from the top down. And our indigenous laws are from the bottom up. So in a very basic sense here, um, what we're referring to is are the concepts and ways and how we govern ourselves, how we manage our, our affairs, as embedded in particular cultural traditions and histories. So there's not one indigenous law. We speak of Sukhwamuk law. Law derives from the long-term social, economic, and political interactions of the members of a society. And I'd like to add to this, actually, uh, as we will show you in our presentation, uh, Sukhwatmukh law is inseparably connected to the land on which we live. And uh, as Napoleon has said, law is the intellectual process of deliberating and reasoning to apply rules according to the context. And as you'll see, law, our, our, the land will remind us of our stories, of our codes of conduct and of our laws. And as I, we travel around the country, mm -hmm. those areas with those stories remind us of that. I'm, I just skipped over the last one because in a way this is something Ron talked about in the preamble. So um, uh, another way of saying this uh, actually stems from one of our very dear elders and teachers, uh, the late Nellie Taylor from Skeetjeston. Um, and she told us uh, some 20 years ago, long time ago, so what more people looked after the land and all the animals and plants, everything in it. That's why they always had plenty to fish. They had deer to hunt and plants to gather for food and medicine, but they had to practice for it and learn about everything on the land first for a long time. Then they knew how to look after it. It was also important for the elders to share each other's knowledge. That was how they learned and built up their understanding. What knowledge they shared had to be exact. And she's saying something here about you can't uh, develop your principles of living and the communication about them without the training that goes with it, the, without the many generations of uh, collective and individual experiences, and especially without the communication about those. So some of the principles that are behind what Nellie had to say here is the sharing of knowledge and the mutual validation. Each time you tell a story, it revalidates the teller his or her relationship with the audience, the land, its places, and ancestors. And 
and was you know I, I used to I used to always feel violated when telling and telling stories uh, uh, and some person not knowing our traditions about story tell, storytelling would come and tell uh, tell me why are you chewing your cabbage twice we've already heard you talk about that story. Yeah. But it's our way that we have to continuously retell the story because in that way, like we say here, it's revalidating it. And uh, another inherent principle here is what Nelly talks about, the concept of uh, what we here call reciprocal accountability, that people are accountable to one another for their actions, for their words, uh, and not just for this generation, for the future, but also people are accountable to the non-humans in the environment that speak back to us and to the land itself that also speaks back to us. One, one example of that uh, would be the language itself. There's laws embedded in language, how you interact with each other. Uh, for example, when I were to speak about any one of you, uh, I would have to speak of you in high praise. But uh, if I spoke about myself, I would have to speak about myself in the diminutive. And knowing that the reciprocity would be, that, that process would be reversed when you spoke of yourself and you spoke about me. And also because as a Suhwepam society, we're a collective society where all is owned, the, the land is owned in common that approach, then you don't challenge each other's egos and cause disharmony in speaking in, through the language to each other in that fashion. And as uh, Nelly mentioned, the concept of practicing, uh, not only practice what you say, but also training as a lifelong occupation. An important principle is that Sukhwapmok laws come from within Sukhwapmok history, not from somewhere else or out of an, some kind of homogenized indigenous concept or theory, but they come from the collective history. And uh, we actually have a story of which Ron is just going to give you a really quick snapshot. Uh, one of our cultural heroes is Sklep or Coyote. And uh, there's a wonderful story about, uh, it's called Coyote and his hosts, of where he continually tries to copy the ways of others and uh, it nearly gets him killed. And maybe you can talk to yeah, that for... A, yeah, there, he, Coyote is traveling along and he runs into different uh, characters like grizzly bear, beaver, uh, fish oil man, and so on and so forth. And each time that he runs into them, they show him, demonstrate and honor him with their ways. And, uh, and he's called upon to reciprocate uh, with what he's, been what he's received from them. But each time he, he wants to show them that he can do whatever they can do, and even better, uh, because he lives next door to the Creator. But uh, having said that, he meets King Fisher. And King Fisher, of course, is honored to meet such a great man as Coyote, right? And so and and so he invites him in his house to honor him with a feast. And uh, but before King Fisher goes uh, to to feast Coyote, he says, "Don't copy me. It's my way. If you copy me, it'll cause you great harm." And uh, so he goes, dives off his house pole, comes up with this beautiful trout glistening in the sun, the, you know, the rainbow trout, a huge one, all the colors of the rainbow. And, and so he feasts Coyote, and all the while Coyote's sitting there, ha, I can do that, I can even do it better. And so at the end of the feast, uh, he, uh, he, 
he invites uh, Kingfisher to come to him. He has to reciprocate what he's received, of course, right? And so one day, Coyote's sitting at home, and uh, there's a knock on the door, bouts and them. Tsurkwa, and Tsurkwa says, it's lost, and Kingfisher comes in. Oh, why, Kokri, I'm happy to see you. Um, Machin, and, and he says, oh, now is my chance. I can show Kingfisher what a great man I am. And so he climbs up on his house pole and uh, he dives. I've been sitting here waiting for Jesus. For a long time. And uh, so he, go, he, he goes and uh, looks for him. And he finds Coyote uh, stuck in this hole in the ice, and he's drowned. And he goes over and says, I told you, Coyote, not to try to copy me. Now look, you've drowned and you're dead. And he goes over there, what should I do with a guy like this? You know, he doesn't listen. He said, maybe I should just kick him in the ice hole. <laughs> but he doesn't. He gives him back his life. And uh, it's kind of like us, as, as the weapon. We've copied the ways of the white people. And we don't know our language, we don't know our history. And you might get kicked in the ice hole, so. <laughs> so we gotta go back and not quit copying others and go back to our laws and our traditions and our customs and stand ourselves up that way. So that's the end of the last episode, and the coyote goes, gallivanting off once he's given his life back, but hopefully we don't do that. Sorry. So on to the uh, concept that we told you we'd like to talk about a little bit. Uh, the concept of Strei or Ye Streis. Um, I heard this first from the late Louisa Basil, who was an elder from Strochtaus, uh, the Bonaparte band by Cash Creek, way back in the mid late 1980s and she used to talk about like sentences like these are the markings of our people a long time ago and uh, referring to pictographs markings that she said the ancient transformers left behind things like coyote rocks and those kind of places also with, na they're named, so they have place names, and they have stories behind them as to what happened there. Uh, they speak to the deeds in the double sense of actions or events that took place on the land in the past. Uh, it connects the Spitekl and Spitekl are stories, or oral histories, oral traditions, whichever way we want to call it that commemorate the pa these past events, the markings on the land, the place names that anchor experience. And together they function to give legitimacy to Suhuamuk ownership, occupation, and jurisdiction of and within Suhuamuk Uluk. So it's the stories, the place names, the physical, visible markings, uh, all commemorating things that people did there in the past, but those things then as events and deeds also translate into something that is somewhat uh, translatable as the, 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 the legal concept of legal deeds to lands, uh, but in a sense that connects it very differently. And we also speak of the terms as connecting it to Sukhwapmuk laws that are situated on the land, just like we have Sukhwapmuk Shushwap land, are things that are written on the land. And in terms of the meaning and etymology of the term and he is uh, So on the one hand, it refers then to the Sukhwapmuk percep perception concept of legitimate possession of and jurisdiction to govern Sukhwapmuk Hutluk that derive from those stories of the past and evidenced by physical and verbal markings. 
Uh, but by way of past human experience and its consequences, the things that people did and the consequences they often uh, suffered or experienced for what they did, Sky connects the land, all the creatures, animals, plants on the land, the land features itself, the landscape, uh, to humans. And Louisa Basil and, and other elders uh, like Nellie Taylor also mentioned that the, you, you could translate as expressing the rights that we have as a people. And uh, it, in the late 1800s, when Sukhwamuk people experienced first the, the dispossession, the uh, being herded off into reserves, the power of the legal statutes that your, your Canadian society asserted for itself in regulating people's lives, the Indian Act, all those kind of things. Um, people began to realize that the power of Euro-Canadian society with its institutions, of course, rests in the written word and the paper. And uh, so the words came to be, to also mean paper and things that are written, writings. And uh, so in that sense, in colloquial Sukhwamukchi nowadays, most people think of it as, so if you hear the words it means paper, but it has that rich history that connects it to the writings of the past, the markings, the rights with an R and the, uh, the deeds of ancestors that give legitimacy to the uh, ownership and jurisdiction over land. Um, I think we're gonna run out of time if we tell every story here, but uh, there, there's actually, uh, during the late- uh, oh, Lots of time. Hmm? <laughs> during the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, Sukhwapmuk uh, people in different communities uh, actually uh, told one another these uh, remarkable stories of resistance where they brought some of the characters from the past back to life, including Skelep, Coyote, and some other Transformers. And in one of these uh, Coyote stories from that time, uh, it's about Coyote losing the paper. And uh, maybe you want to really quickly just summarize it. <laughs> you trust me to do that? <laughs> uh, no, uh, the creator was, uh, felt sorry for Coyote and gave him paper and said, uh, because before that, any time he wanted to learn anything, he had to go and rummage through his excrement to learn things, eh? Uh, and so the creator felt sorry for him and gave him paper. And as he was going along one day, oh, it's easy, he had to go. So he set his paper down and did his thing and got up and took off. And somewhere down the road, he's, oh, my paper, he goes back and it's gone. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, uh, uh, that it, what, what that is, uh, speaks to is that there's more knowledge in life lived experiences in, in studying scatology. He was a great scatologist. You, you could know where people came from, what they ate, when they were there, what their DNA is, and on and on and on. Whereas paper is just black and white flat but enough said yeah and uh, just uh, by way of the uh, markings on the land uh, these are some of the types of markings that we have that connect to people and stories the pictographs that you find throughout many often secluded locations that uh, bear evidence of uh, people in the past having having trained in those areas, trained for power. Um, story, uh, images or markings that connect to uh, transformer stories, of which we'll tell you a little bit more. This is uh, in Pavilion Canyon, where uh, Tli is a, a young man who uh, was uh, vanquishing the eagle, which eventually resulted in humans being able to use eagle feathers. Uh, uh, Pretended he got smashed against the rock, and uh, but he did. Spewed he, red uh, out of his, out of his mouth red. against the rock. And so those markings are on the walls of uh, it's, it's Marble Canyon by Pavilion. 
Uh, sometimes we see them in these crowded places nowadays, another Transformer story of uh, goat sisters also vanquished by Tlisa and his brothers. Uh, Garlene Dodson, one of our elders in Skeetchison, uh, told us one day, oh, you have to go to the Husky Station in Cache Creek and just look up and you'll see the Goat Sisters. They're right there. Hmm. And uh, one of uh, the remarkable ones uh, of the Tlisa epic, uh, which re uh, ends uh, with uh, Tlisa and his brothers, who are a group of transformers, uh, seeing a young girl, a chipmunk girl, who is training on the other side of the Fraser River, and uh, each one of them with uh, their mutual powers uh, turns or tult, as Ron explained in the beginning, freezes one another into rock columns. And you can see the arrows there if you go on a raft through uh, High Bar, through, uh, through the Fraser River at High Bar Canyon, those uh, markings are still visible there. Many others actually throughout the history of the last 50 years in highway widening and uh, all sorts of other logging and so forth have actually been blown apart. So turning to the types and genres of or stories, uh, to draw out, as John Boros put it, uh, the uh, concepts of law behind it. Uh, we have our sklep stories, coyote stories, and more than moral educational tales, uh, there is actually something to them that connects them to the ancient history of Suhuap Mohotluk, or Shushwap country. Notably, Tate found in 1900, James Tate, who is an ethnographer, that uh, people were telling him about, in the days of the coyote people, which are the most ancient ancestors, um, there were no lakes or rivers. It was very hot. There was a flood. Coyote's house is in a glacier. It was, always, it was hot and high winds. And it actually, uh, the climate describes very nicely fits the kind of climate uh, at the uh, end of the last ice age. And um, we had a series of uh, glacial lakes throughout the interior. Um, and uh, on, on one day, in around exactly almost 9,740 to 10,000 years ago, the ice dam that held the whole thing in place burst and sent a huge amount of water coming down the river and the Fraser. Uh, or the Thompson River system actually reversed itself. Instead of flowing into the Columbia, it began flushing down into the Fraser River system. And uh, coyote stories that at exactly the spot where this uh, fish, the, the uh, ice dam was uh, said to have been, according to uh, geological information, um, was also a place where Skelep burst an ancient fish dam that was held in place by some uh, medicine, two medicine women who lived there. And uh, Coyote then guided the salmon up the river. Um, but, uh, but the important part of it is that uh, he, he uh, caused the, the women to have children, thereby creating kinship ties between uh, uh, the coyote people and the, and, and the people from downriver. And uh, they, they, that way he was able to break their power because in Shushwap law you cannot uh, uh, withhold food from your kinship you have to provide it. And mm -hmm. so that's how the, he was able to get their powers to, from withholding the salmon from us. Mm -hmm. And other uh, often called transformer stories uh, talk of the deeds of uh, a group of young people. Some of them were the uh, brothers who actually encountered Coast Salish, a group of Coast Salish people that came up the Fraser River or up through Harrison and Anderson Lake through the Squamish area. And uh, we, uh, if we put together the uh, information from those oral histories uh, and the 
information we know from uh, the divergence of Salish languages from the coast into the interior, and archaeological information about the uh, what's called the Loch Nor phase, some four and a half thousand to five thousand years ago, as well as what the little bit that we have by way of uh, DNA information, we can actually uh, pretty much bet and determine that what took place in those transformer stories uh, were, were events connected to history that took place about four and a half thousand to five thousand years ago. And uh, others who by kinship are connected to those who first met the foreigners coming up the Fraser River are Tlisa and his brothers who are who basically demarcated the places throughout Sukhwatmok country. And um, one of the things around those coyote people in these stories that first met then the transformers who came in from the outside was what uh, Ron has called the law of nationhood of trespass and reciprocity by way of coyote sitting on a rock in the interior uh, meeting those first foreigners that came his way. And uh, maybe you want to briefly talk about that. <laughs> Uh, he was sitting on a rock and he tried to transform him, but they were only able to transform his footprints into rock. And he says, Why are you trying to cause me harm? Were you not given the task like myself to fix the land for your people that are coming? And, and uh, that is my job that, that I have. That is my work. I could cause you greater harm, but I won't. Uh, he said, know this also, that this is my land. I will allow you to pass, but you're not allowed to stay. <laughs> I, I will not interfere with your work, and you don't interfere with my work. Doesn't that sound familiar? Interfering in the internal affairs of, of, of another? Uh, and let us strive to help each other and to look after each other. This, fo this forms the, the, the whole concept of sovereignty, of nationhood, and all that it entails in being a sovereign nation and na developing nation-to-nation -nation relations. And I even go so far as to say this little story disavows the doctrine of discovery. And uh, uh, as Coyote met up with them, uh, these two transformers in another part of his territory, and he, and he threatened uh, to do them in lest they acknowledge that this was Coyote's homeland and leave forthwith, and so they did. And uh, this story uh, speaks, if you guys Google the Sir Wilfrid Laurie Memorial, you'll see the echo of the story in that memorial. But mm -hmm. time is always a, a devil when I'm talking. <laughs> uh, so this concept of, on the one hand, the laws between groups, between nations, and the issue of sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis others, uh, was, as Ron said, echoed in the uh, very important memorial to Sir Wilfrid Laurier that the chiefs from the interior uh, presented to him in 1910 in addressing the land question. Um, the, the, the statements here also address the issue of internal land tenure which uh, in the words of the late Mar Dr. Mary Thomas from Nisconleth, uh, she very emphatically said that uh, the whole territory of the Sukhwatmuk nation was shared by all the Sukhwatmuk people. Nothing was private property. We always shared. Elder Henry Squinahan from Esket 
said the same thing. They didn't have internal boundaries. The land belonged to all the Sokwapmukh. And uh, throughout the different testimonies and statements, the ethnographic information that uh, James Tate recorded from elders in the early 1900s, uh, we have this concept of common collective Sokwapmukh land tenure as opposed to land tenure, let, let alone private property by individuals, but also not at the basis, uh, at the uh, level of individual, what we now have as bands, First Nations, communities. And uh, so with that goes the concept that plateau resource ownership uh, function functions on a nation basis through kinship and descent. But uh, before going further, I'd like to point out that uh, this this concept of, of, of communal ownership, common ownership of the land and resources uh, was underscored uh, you, you, and so importantly that, uh, that it said the people, our chiefs in 1910, said that it was the same as life itself, for without that common ownership of the land, we wouldn't have lived. That's how significant and important they underscored that concept. And of course, with that concept of common land tenure through kinship and uh, descent comes the issue of uh, the importance of what we call here, my relatives, knowing who your relatives are and keeping those kinship ties alive. There's much more to be said about the issue of land tenure and of the uh, ownership of territory, but we want to uh, briefly, in broad strokes, move on to a couple of other areas. Uh, one is the concept of environmental law or relations. And um, an important principle here is, uh, if you look at the diagram here, uh, Sokwapmukh land, for those that for, in the end, 10,000 years, lived within the territory and continued to do so, is a known and named environment. Uh, each type of landform is predictable and uh, people were not nomadic, as is often uh, mistakenly said, but uh, lived a transhuman a way of life where they went to different resource producing locations, seasonal round after seasonal round. and. Uh, the territory is uh, rich in biodiversity and species. One of the most uh, threatened areas in the south central interior are the uh, mid-elevation grasslands, which are currently under threat around all sorts of different environments between urban sprawl and mining in, in particular. And uh, in a small area that looks to be fairly bare grasslands, when we uh, did a survey just this past year, uh, we found as many as 127 edible and usable, like food and medicinal species that most people are not aware of. And I'm just gonna skip through a couple of these. Of importance here is also the relationship with trees. Uh, that is expressed in a story about Coyote taking his first wife, who was a tree. And maybe you can yeah. address uh, what when, the... when Coyote was sent, given his instructions by Tchalt Gugbi, uh, the creator, to come down and fix the land up for us, uh, on his way down along with the transformers, uh, he found that there was very little trees or any, m not much grass around, so he took a tree for a wife. And so we look at trees uh, as part of our, our kinship ties because like a, 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 like a good mother, the tree gives us his breath, her breath, and we give our breath back to it. And she cares for our foods and our medicinal medicines that she protects and, and nurtures underneath her and so that we can grow and prosper as a people. Uh, but also, <clears throat> In, in terms of th that work, uh, and uh, when, I don't know whether we'll get to it, uh, but when, uh, after the coyote finished his work, he left, and that work, the creator came down and took 
the Okanagans and the Shuswaps and Tlacapans off to their respective territories and gave us our territories and our languages and uh, with our laws of kinship on how we, to, we were to interact with each other. Another important story is metaphor for relations between humans, animals, the water, the land, the sky, and the atmosphere is an, an epic story about the trout children that was uh, recorded by the uh, linguist uh, Art Kuypers with uh, the late Chief Charlie Draney from our community. And uh, interestingly, it, uh, Kuypers himself never asked Charlie Draney where did this take place. Uh, it was kind of a bit of a detective work to put two and two together by way of the uh, uh, work of George M. Dawson, who was with the Geological Survey and was a bit of an amateur ethnographer, who actually asked, what's the name of that place and uh, where, does that where did that story happen? And uh, so he actually connected it to the, the, a lake. It's the, whoops, it's this lake here. It's called Jacko Lake, just south of Kamloops. It's kind of over the hill from Kamloops. And uh, in the story, uh, there, the, the, uh, it's about reciprocal connection between humans, fish, animal, birds, and plants by way of mutual transformation. It's between generations of a grandmother, her daughter, the grandchildren, the grandfather. So it includes all those elements of kinship. And it speaks about the land, as this is where the story starts, uh, where the grandmother lives with her, she makes herself a daughter. The daughter then goes into the water and she goes under the water and meets her husband who is a water person. And uh, eventually her children come back up to the surface and then go into the sky world where the grandfather lives. And uh, as we were kind of puzzling this out and talking it over with elders and uh, trying to figure out what is it all about. In, in, in some parts, it's about the water cycle. And it's, it's sort of like code talk for the different elements as they fit together. And uh, the lake itself is called Pipsil, which then addresses all those different relationship. And it's probably also the, the connection to the water people that live under the water. Um, in all likelihood has to do with aquifers that lead into the Thompson River system from that area. And we talked earlier about the uh, important and in a way inseparable connection between the land where stories take place and the markings that they leave on the land that then lead to the principles of conduct and human and environmental relationship. And of course, uh, those kind of relationships are under threat of forever getting severed by way of that lake being taken away. Uh, this is a plan for a mine over the hill from us. Uh, the poor little lake is going to become, if some people have their way, uh, stuck between a waste management facility or tailings pond and a large open pit. But we wanted to just remind you that uh, that kind of connection that exists between land stories and law is one that really factors in those places as continuing. Other principles around resource laws is the respect for all living resources. Um, and elders like uh, Ida Matthew from uh, Simch, one of our communities, reminded us that we were, when we were kids, we were never allowed to play with animals, to torture them, to carelessly treat them. And uh, there's the um, belief also that, or in the knowledge that humans inherently are quant pitiful. And it's the animals that people hunt who are not by way of the skill of the hunter alone or by way of fluke shot and killed, but they actually give themselves to the humans. So it's an active interrelationship between the hunter and the hunted and the animal and the human. Another important concept is and what- You always leave an, an offering after you've 
taken an animal or a fish or whatever. Even the, when you go pick berries or you pick medicines, you always leave an offering. Show of honor, of respect for that. Because all things in Shushwap are, are animate. There's no, no such thing as inanimate objects for us. And in the same sense, we can speak of a concentric concept of environmental relations that uh, in the Sukhwatmok language, people use the relative terms to speak of and to speak to animals that are hunted or fished. So as uh, Laura Harry from Esket said, the salmon are our first children. So thinking of them in the same manner as you think of human children. And in the same manner, then when we say all my relations, it does not only include the sphere of human relations, but it includes the relations with all things in the environment. And the different concepts then behind the uh, environmental laws, and I, I hate to use the term resources here because we really don't think of them as resources, but as living things that interact with us, is the concept of aimstech, you honor, respect them in a reciprocal relation. Gukstech, you thank them, and the Sokwatmuk term, thanking somebody actually means you saved me. And uh, animals gukmanchut, or give themselves to humans because they pity us. And so in that sense, then you don't waste any part of them. Let's just skip over this in the part, I think. How are we doing for time? Or got about five more minutes to finish off? He's all in a hurry. Oh, okay. Yeah, about five minutes. Yeah. Right. Throw him out. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, you want, did you want to speak? Just okay. Hmm? Uh, the the Skelia, the sweat house, is uh, is really uh, an important uh, uh, gift that was given to us from the Creator. It was, uh, it was a direct gift from the Creator, and uh, because it is through this the Skelia, the sweat house, that we were we went from uh, we talked about the world where animals and humans transformed with each other. But when we got the Skhili, we went through the Skhili and we re attained our humanity as we, as we know us, uh, us today. And uh, the only way we can get to that other power is if we go and vision quest. Then we can retain that other power that we had before the Skhili. And the Skhili is, uh, is, is called the open face spirit. In other words, you, when you go there, nothing is left hidden all things are left wide open. You bear your soul, as it were. And uh, the Creator told the uh, fur boughs that you'll be the helper uh, of the sweat house uh, this, uh, and the water spirit as well, that they would both be the helpers of the, the sweat house and offer, give uh, help to the people, whatever they need help for when they enter and request it. So this reciprocity that we, uh talked about, it extends from reciprocity between humans and animals, plants, but also to uh, humans among one another. And uh, again, Nellie Taylor had a wonderful story or memory about two young men who uh, went to one of our uh, fishing lakes, Chachium Lake. And the two, she was, Nellie was with another elder and the two young men started catching some fish and cooking the fish by the fire and not sharing with the elders. And Nellie said, sure enough, they quit running after that uh, because they experienced the consequences of not sharing. Uh, and we also have the concepts of a nuisance, being a nuisance, begging, freeloading, as contradicting the law of a and wach, respecting, with various types of terms connected to that. And uh, the, the, the law of yaoyut, the corollary of that in, in, in common law, is uh, uh, violating one's ability for quiet enjoyment. And it has, just like the, the law of quiet enjoyment in common law, 
it has various consequences depending upon the seriousness of the violation. Uh, it could be just uh, somebody scolding you, or in traditional times it could mean either uh, uh, being thrown out of the nation. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, what is the term for that now? I, I got ostracized. Ostracized. Uh, you know, uh, which was a serious offense because you, you, you can't live on your own. You can't survive on your own in those days. Mm -hmm. You'd probably wind up dying. So it'd be like a death sentence. Mm -hmm. The seriousness of violating the law of Yawyud at that level. As a matter of fact, there are stories in which that has occurred. And finally, besides <laughs> species, human to human relations, uh, it's also the land itself and the weather that is considered an animate entity. We have a term, uh, the land or the sky will turn on you, or it'll warn you, but also turn on you. And uh, if we, as a people, violate the uh, relationship of reciprocity, that's what will happen. The land will act up and get back to you. And uh, the term means that it's our role as a to protect the integrity of our homeland. The long lasting impacts of careless resource extraction with environmental, geological, hydrological, health, cultural impacts severely compromise our ability to, do, uh, to act as caretakers and would challenge our responsibility according to Sukhwatmukh law to act in that manner. According to the principle of Chaenskt, the land will inevitably turn on those who harm it. Chaenskt also means that guests who come into Sukhwatmukh land and irresponsibly, irresponsibly harm the land are in deep violation of the obligation they have to the land as guests. So we have about one minute and just very briefly uh, to talk about a couple of principles around laws of social conduct. Uh, we've mentioned earlier the important principle of being relatives to one another and that this entails intergenerational responsibilities among the parent to the child generation, the grandparents to the grandchildren, older siblings to younger siblings and so on and so forth. And numerous stories that speak of animals as humans who can become animals and animals that can become human speak of the violation of those kind of responsibilities in interacting. Um, one is the uh, story of Owl and Chipmunk, uh, who were Chipmunk actually uh, kind of with a, using a pun, but uh, a bit of a, saying that, uh, how shall I say it, uh, violates her grandfather Owl's uh, sort of sense of self. Uh, she brings it upon her that she gets hurt. Um, another principle, supporting someone who is in trouble and falls apart. You guys need to hear the real version. <laughs> The story of Suckerfish, uh, who crash lands when he misses the lake he's supposed to have come down into from the upper world, and the different animals all combine forces to put him back together again. And uh, has anybody ever had a skeleton of a suckerfish? Uh, we don't really care for them too much uh, nowadays, but. Uh, uh, according to the story, there are all these different animals in the sucker fish. So Ron brought me a sucker fish a couple of years ago, and I boiled it up and looked for the bones. There was an eagle feather. There was a moose antler. There was a loon. There was, uh, what else, uh, a buffalo head. And uh, literally, it, it's, it's a very bony fish, so it has all these different kind of bones that look just and, like... And the skin was uh, of our... Our, our, our gill net. Yeah, they wrapped him up in they a gill wrapped net. Him to hold them back together. And uh, of course, uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, you're so smashed up, some, someone was uh, very generous enough and uh, gave him uh, his uh, asshole for a mouse. <laughs> and, but uh, he was really a handsome man before that. And 
now he's uh, very uh, ashamed and he lives and hides at the bottom of the water. But the moral of the story is this, is that what the story comes, it's quite an epic story, and too bad we couldn't get into it uh, in detail, but nonetheless, the, the, the birds, and uh, they go to war uh, uh, with uh, the sky people, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and as they're escaping, they all, the birds can fly down, but the fish uh, can't, and they leap down to various different types of dolly and trout and all of that, make it into the, make it reach the water down below, but except for the sucker fish. And uh, he gets smashed up, and it's everybody's responsibility. You don't leave anybody behind. You have to go back. It's your duty to your kin to, to put them back together and, 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 and nurture them back to life. Uh, and that's what the, the moral of the story is. is. Even if it means giving a piece of yourself, you know, your liver or your kidney or you know, heart transplant or <laughs> stuff like that, right? So that's the, the moral of that story. Mm -hmm. and there's, uh, there's other morals too, yeah. but that's one of them. And many of these spectacles also deal with the consequences for not providing help and support to relatives. The story of Owl is about children's child neglect. The parents neglect uh, the young child and the owl takes it. Um, and the consequences and sanctions of violating the norms of community, society, kinship, reciprocity, and respect. We have it all in different kinds of stories that deal with every one of those aspects. Too, too numerous to hear, tell them all. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think our time is up. Um, and uh, so, in, by way of conclusions, principles and manifestations of Sakwat Mokhla continue to exist in Stptekul. These principles are based on human experience, inseparable from Sakwat Mokholuk. The threat, of course, is that because the markings in the landscape are integrally connected to the deeds of ancestors, destruction of land harms the integrity of laws. And the principles of Sukhwamok law have relevance for the future in guiding our institutions. Perhaps we could, uh, if there's anybody who has a question or have time for a couple of questions. Put your hand up and we'll hand you the mic. Don't be shy. Uh, actually, I have a question, if you don't mind my starting. Uh, you know, the laws that you're talking about all relate to land and resources and that. Mm -hmm. Is there also a criminal aspect to the uh, law in oral tradition? You know, like yeah, th that was the last part here. That, uh, um, I mean, the, the truth is, of course, that many of the deal in a way with what we've called it laws of social conduct as a, in a positive sense, but really deal with criminal acts, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who gets really out of hand. And uh, what are the consequences of that? Uh, sometimes being ostracized, uh, sometimes, and it, it, there's a very strong uh, principle behind that, that the actions of an individual are not just the actions of an individual's, but it's the collective behind that person. Uh, and that collective, in some ways, has to be accountable and take responsibility for that person who gets out of hand, who commits a crime. Uh, if that person gets so far out of hand that he or she can't be corrected or taken to task, it's the group who surrenders that person to the victims. Yeah. yeah, I just um, remember, in, like, for example, mm -hmm. in, in Blackfoot tradition, there's mm -hmm. this idea of retaliation in kind, and mm -hmm. that kind of keeps peace in the village because, mm -hmm. you know, if you step out of line, whoever you harm uh, has the legal right to uh, retaliate right, and yeah. cause you harm in that respect, you know, the same way. Yeah, does anybody else have any, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Oh, here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> don't be shy. Hello. The only bad question is the one you don't ask. <laughs> I just wondered what were some of the different ways you went about um, capturing the, the laws? Was it mainly through talking to elders in the community? Um, 
just wondering. Uh, no, through various facets of, uh, yeah, going and interviewing elders, uh, conducting research and going back. Uh, we're fortunate in, in, in that we had some, uh, some people that come and visit us and did a lot of recording. One of them was James Tate, for example, recorded uh, a plethora of stories, but they're all in English. So we have to, and we're, we have to rethink them in Sukhwapam. We have to rethink them in Sukhwapam. Uh, there was uh, Kennedy and Bouchard, but we have to go back to the original tapings because they, their interpretation of, uh, of the stories was a little different than what the, the, the storyteller told about. So different facets like that that we went to. And uh, uh, yeah. A lot of it is also like a group kind of effort. Uh, one is uh, to uh, basically discuss what's actually going on in this story here with uh, elders and usually putting our thinking caps on together uh, is a much more productive way than kind of trying to do it one on one. And we've, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, we've kind of taken this on the road to communities in the last couple of years. We have one of our road collaborators, Dorothy Christian, uh, with us here, and I, I think that's led to more and continued deep thinking about stories. Okay. Is there a question over here? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you both very much for that. It's fascinating. And I'm really glad that you made that comment about the language of resources when you talk, speak of taking a sledgehammer to the slag of colonialism that the language of resources is the language of stocks and flows mm -hmm. of accounting, of exploitation, and it, it's not the language of, of relationship mm -hmm. of which you speak, and it's something that's so really close to my heart is that how we open up the language of relationality that even the mm -hmm. scientists and economists that are charged with managing resources, I mean, if we're talking about the language of measuring, monitoring, surveillance, and control mm -hmm. for stuff that we love, Mm -hmm. as well as need. So how can you break out of this rotten language? Learn to quote Mokchin. Thank you. By the way, uh, the, the, the Shushwap language, uh, the English language is an infant compared to the Shushwap language. And uh, an interesting thing about the, in, the English language is that you have, I think, uh, a, a total of a million and one words, and that's the end of the language, the end of the line. But in Suhwap Mkhjin, there's you can make as many words up as your imagination can come up with. It's like the periodic tables. You take this little piece here and this, you put them together and you come up with a different word. Uh, that you it's endless. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Oh, there's for, uh, another question over here. I was I was going to say just to invite you all up to come and no, talk no, to no, our we, guests. Uh, or? Give this lady a chance. Okay. Here. <laughs> <laughs> We, we got time. We're, we're here. I'm stuck here till the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys got to be stuck here for the morning. <laughs> um, so what I was wondering is about... Oh, I have to yeah. Okay, what about the birthing of new um, laws on land? Not necessarily mm -hmm. um, new stories, uh, but retelling mm -hmm. of old law and then maybe new or new relationships demonstrated in land that's been destroyed mm -hmm. um, or just the ongoing process of what you've explained, because you were talking about things that exist in the past to which we can look in order to better understand mm -hmm. our place um, within the context of the living world of which we're a part. But what about someone comes along and tells a new coyote story, or mm -hmm. finds a new something on a rock that represents um, a new take on, on mm -hmm. ways of being in the world, or just old take but retold in a new location? Well, that, uh, that, that does happen, and the way that, 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 that's, that comes about in Suhwap culture is through what we call the atcham, uh, or the vision questing, the individual going out on his own, and thereby getting their power or you know, getting uh, an understanding, a new understanding of what's going on and how we can manage it and deal with it and comes back with that power and uses it to help better the community. Yeah, but I, I would actually, uh, we mentioned the story of the paper, right? And uh, there was certainly 
around you know the uh, Indian land rights movement in the late 1900s, early 20th century, uh, there was a flourishing reworking of old stories to meet the needs of the then present. And uh, I, I think in, th there's been that incredible rupture of the 20th century with the, having the language taken away, residential schools, all the things that you, are, you know or are learning about. Um, but I, I think the experience of the last few years of taking this on the road a little bit, re and, and not just reading, but re-performing stories as connected to the land uh, generates, number one, new interpretations that guide the future and that are for the present, uh, but it also generates new tellings. And uh, so I'd really like to emphasize that uh, this is a dynamic process. Uh, just because we're casting the lens here on the past and at some point, you know, the long ago past, uh, it doesn't mean that they're not dynamic and we don't create new ones. I mean, the, the Kingfisher one, I think, uh, is a good example of being a particular reflection on Ron's interests around uh, that uh, you don't just take it, take what other, other people can do with their powers. You have, they have to come from within. So that was an example of how you take an old story and make it new. And so I often say, let's, let's take our past and make it our future, you know? And uh, I, I also, if, I, if I'm to leave uh, a thought with you here tonight, uh, the thought that I would like to leave with you is let us go forward and let no one's, no one people's knowledge ever again stand in the shadow of another. Yeah. <laughs>